Hi, this is joint work with Muli Sagib, Sharon Shoham, and James Wilcox, and it's about invariant inference, a set of techniques for proving the safety of transition systems. Suppose, for example, we have a system over n propositional variables representing a number in binary, which starts from zero, and in each step incremented by some even number. This defines the reachable states of the system. Now we want to prove that no reachable state is a bad state, and here bad means that this is the state where all the bits are one. We want to prove safety by finding an inductive invariant, which is a set of states that includes all the initial states, excludes all the bad states, and is closed under transitions of the system. There's no transition from inside the invariant to outside the invariant. For example, the property that not all the bits are one, of course, holds, but it's not an inductive invariant because there is a transition from a state where not all bits are one to the state where all bits are one. But we can strengthen this property to the, say that the least significant bit is not one, and this is an inductive invariant. If you start from a state where the least significant bit is not one, you also end up after one step in a state where, where the least significant bit is not one. So this is an inductive invariant. And once you have this inductive invariant, it over approximates the set of reachable states and separates it from the set of bad states, establishing safety. Now, I know what you're thinking. Tell me not of this invariant inference, which is so hard, for already for Boolean programs and polynomially long invariants, it is NP-hard with access to a SAT solver to find an invariant. But oh, in practice, invariant inference algorithms do pretty well in many cases finding an invariant. So there's a gap between the theory and the practice of invariant inference, which we're trying to address in this work. In this work, we analyze an interpolation-based invariant inference algorithm and prove complexity results, classes of transition systems and invariants for which the algorithm successfully infers an invariant in a polynomial number of SAT calls. Our main insight is that the complexity of this algorithm can be understood as a manifestation of exact learning theory, the theory of learning exact classifiers using queries, but invariant, invariant inference is a harder problem, so we need also to combine some elements of the geometry of the Hamming cube, and together this gives us an understanding of the complexity of this algorithm and related variants. So I'm going to show you a known invariant inference algorithm and then we are going to analyze its complexity. So the algorithm is an, an interpolation-based invariant inference algorithm, and this is how it, it goes. It starts with the candidate invariant that includes just the initial states, and then performs bounded model checking, checking that from that candidate, it's impossible to get to a bad state in k plus one steps of the system. Once we know that, we know that the post image of the candidate, the states reachable in one step from the candidate, these states can't reach a bad state in at most k steps. The goal of an interpolation-based inference is to over-approximate this set while retaining the property that no state can reach a bad state in k steps, then taking this interpolant, adding, in, adding it to the invariant to obtain a new candidate. Now that we have this new candidate, the process repeats. We do bounded model checking of k plus one steps. We take the post image, we try to over-approximate it, adding this to the invariant, and so on and so forth, unless it so happens that actually we can reach a bad state in k plus one steps. This is a failure of the algorithm, and it needs to be restarted with a larger bound k. Okay, so this is the overall structure of interpolation-based inference. Now I'm going to show a specific way of computing interpolants. It's a model-based way uh, inspired by generalization in IC3 and PDR, and I'm going to demonstrate it on the example we had before. And so it goes on like this. In each step, we sample a state from the post image, so for example, this state, and then we write the conjunction that captures exactly that state. So we know about this conjunction that every state that satisfies this conjunction cannot reach a bad state in k steps of the system. Okay, now we want to generalize from this fact and from this model, and this we do by dropping literals from the conjunction as long as still no state can reach a bad state in k steps. So we, for example, we try to drop this literal, and after we drop it, still no state that satisfies this conjunction can reach a bad state in k steps, so we drop this literal. Now we move on to the next literal and check whether after dropping that literal, no state can reach a bad state in k steps, and the answer is that everything is okay. So we drop also this literal. This we do for all literals. We, when we get to the literal about the least significant bit, we find that if we drop this literal, then we can get to a bad state 
in at most k steps of the system. So we can't drop this literal, so we don't. After we do this to all literals, we get the interpolant that the least significant bit is zero, and we add this to the invariant. And actually, this candidate is already an inductive invariant, and there is much rejoicing, for we have found an inductive invariant and established the safety of the system. So this is how the algorithm works. It computes a candidate invariant in disjunctive normal form. It's a disjunction of conjunctions, where each conjunction is generated from some counterexample, from some state, a counterexample to the inductiveness of the previous candidate, and, generaliz and generalization happens by dropping literals as long as no state in the candidate can reach a bad state in k steps. So this is the algorithm, and now we want to understand it theoretically. How many iterations are required for this algorithm to converge to an inductive invariant? To answer this question, we also need to answer another question, which is how large should k be in order for this algorithm to converge to an invariant at all, rather than get to a candidate that can reach a bad state, restart with a larger k? So we're going to answer both these questions. And our main result is that this algorithm successfully infers an invariant in a polynomial number of SAT calls whenever there exists an invariant that satisfies the fence condition, a property of reachability of the Hamming boundary of the invariant, and that invariant has a syntactic form that matches results in exact learning theory. So if it's a monotone DNF invariant, there are no negated variables, then the algorithm successfully infers it in a polynomial number of SAT calls. Or if it's an almost monotone DNF formula, almost all the terms are monotone, then a different yet related algorithm can provably infer an invariant in a polynomial number of SAT calls. What we're going to see in order to understand this algorithm is that it's an incarnation of an algorithm from exact learning, a classification algorithm essentially, and we can lift complexity results from exact learning to the invariant inference algorithm. But there's some more to it because this only works when the invariant satisfies an extra property that it is k-fenced. So let's start talking about the fence condition. We're thinking about the state space of the system as vertices of the Boolean hypercube. Here, this is the three-dimensional hypercube, also sometimes known as the cube. So if this is the invariant, these are the states in the boundary of the invariant. These are the states of Hamming distance one from the invariant, the, the states that are just outside the invariant. So this is the boundary. And the fence condition requires that these states all can reach a bad state in at most k steps of the system. So this is the fence condition. Picture differently, here we have on the right-hand side all the states that are outside the invariant, and the red band is the states in the boundary. And the requirement is that all these states in the boundary all can get to a bad state in at most k steps, although other states outside the invariant don't necessarily get to a bad state in k steps or at all. So this is the, the fence condition. In the example system we had before, with the invariant that the least significant bit is never one, this is the boundary, and every state in the boundary can get to the bad state in just one step. So this invariant is k-fenced for every k greater or equal to one. In the paper, we also have more complex examples where the boundary reaches a bad state in k steps, but other states outside the invariant don't. The importance of the fence condition is that it constrains the candidate invariant the algorithm maintains. As the algorithm grows a candidate, this candidate always remains a subset of the k-fenced invariant. This is because if we try to include a state from outside the invariant, because the way generalization works, we have also to include a state from the boundary. But states in the boundary can get to a bad state in k steps per the fence condition, and so the algorithm detects that and won't include that state. And this is why the candidate of the algorithm always remains a subset of the k-fenced invariant. This means that if k is large enough so that there exists a k-fenced invariant, the algorithm necessarily converges to some inductive invariant, it can't overshoot, get to a state where it needs to restart. The question that remains is, how fast does the algorithm converge to an inductive invariant? We're going to answer this question by leveraging ideas and results from exact learning theory. So let's talk about exact learning theory. In this setting, the learner tries to identify an unknown formula phi by asking a series of questions. So it can ask, is it psi 1? And the teacher responds either yes or no and a differentiated counterexample. The learner then may ask, is it 
psi2, and the teacher responds. These are called equivalence queries. Another kind of query is, for example, is sigma3 a model of the unknown formula? And the teacher responds either yes or no. These are called membership queries. After a series of such queries, the algorithm needs to identify the unknown formula phi. So this is the model in exact learning, and it's great, many algorithms, many results. What does it have to do with invariant inference? So ideally, we would like to use the same algorithms and using a series of equivalence and membership queries, identifying unknown inductive invariant. The problem is that in invariant inference, it's not enough to implement the learner, we also need to implement the teacher. And unfortunately, we know that in general, it's impossible. There's no efficient way to answer equivalence and membership queries, and thus no way to implement exact learning algorithms as invariant inference algorithms. In this work, we show that it is possible to implement these queries, and thus to implement exact learning algorithms when the invariant satisfies the fence condition, and the algorithm's queries are what we call one-sided, and that this can yield interpolation like invariant inference algorithms. The way this works, we take an exact learning algorithm, specifically the exact learning algorithm for disjunctive normal form formulas. We take the queries and try to implement them for invariant inference, so we use an inductiveness check to answer equivalence queries and use bounded model checking to answer membership queries, and the result is seemingly an invariant inference algorithm we only need to make sure that we answer queries correctly. Right? We're now querying an unknown inductive invariant rather than some known formula. This is where we need to restrict the algorithm's queries to be one-sided and also use the fence condition. So we require that the equivalence checks the algorithm performs are such that counterexamples are only positive, and this justifies why we take the post state of the counterexample to induction when we implement the equivalence query as an inductiveness check. So this is the restriction on equivalence queries. Our constraint on membership queries is that the algorithm performs them only on examples that are either positive or having distance one from a positive examples, in which case we can use the fence condition to ensure that our implementation of membership queries using bounded model checking is correct. On such examples, we know that bounded model checking with bound k returns the correct result of inclusion inside the invariant, although we don't actually know the invariant when we perform the check. And lo and behold, when applied to this exact learning algorithm that learns DNF formulas, the result is exactly the model-based, interpolation-based invariant inference algorithm we talked about earlier. And this is great, because we can obtain complexity results from the learning algorithm to the interpolation algorithm. Overall, and a bit more precisely, this transformation yields the theorem that if there is an exact learning algorithm that efficiently identifies every formula from some class in a polynomial number of one-sided queries, then there exists an invariant inference algorithm that successfully infers every k-fenced invariant from that class in a polynomial number of SAT calls. We apply this result to the complexity guarantee of the exact learning algorithm from DNF we had, and we get that the model-based, interpolation-based invariant in inference algorithm from before successfully infers an invariant in a polynomial number of SAT calls whenever there exists a k-fenced invariant that has a short DNF representation and is monotone. So in that representation, all the variables appear positively. In, in that case, we have proved that the algorithm successfully infers an invariant in a polynomial number of SAT calls. We can apply the same theorem to a different algorithm, doing the transformation on a different algorithm with a different complexity result. This is an algorithm by Beshuti that learns almost monotone DNA formulas, and we get the theorem that a different yet related algorithm successfully infers an invariant in a polynomial number of SAT calls whenever there's an almost monotone short DNF representation, meaning that almost all the terms in the DNF representation don't have negated variables. We also have another variant of this transformation from exact learning to invariant inference that can do without the restriction that the algorithm performs queries that are only one-sided at the expense that the condition on the invariant in the transition system needs to be stronger. They need to satisfy a two-sided version of the fence condition. And using this result, we can prove, applied to a different algorithm by Beshuti, we can prove that there is an invariant inference algorithm that successfully infers any invariant that has a short representation 
as a decision tree as long as, the, as it satisfies this two-sided version of the fence condition. And this concludes our complexity results for interpolation-based invariant inference algorithms. Before we part, I'd like to say a few words about robustness. What happens to the fence condition when the program undergoes modifications? Suppose we have some original system and, and invariant, and some transformation results in a new system and invariant. For example, we could rename variables and flip between a variable and its negation. We could combine the initial or bad states of two systems. We could add a new variable that captures some relation over the existing variables. And we could try to make the invariant monotone by hook and by crook, introducing new variables that capture the negation of original variables. The question then is, what happens to the fence condition? Suppose that the original invariant satisfied the fence condition, does the new, the new invariant also satisfy the fence condition? So we can show that for the first two transformations, the fence condition is robust. If the invariant was fenced before the transformation, then it's also fenced after the transformation. However, for the other two, it's not the case. So once we introduce a new variable that captures some relation over the existing variables, the old invariant is no longer k-fenced, and the algorithm can't provably converge to it. Although, in that case, there may be a new invariant that uses the new variable we've introduced, and that invariant would be k-fenced, but in any case, the old invariant won't be k-fenced, and we can't uh, provably converge to it. In the last transformation, the situation is, is worse, because if we try to replace the original negated variables in the invariant with the new variables, not only the original invariant is no longer fenced, the new invariant also is not fenced. So it doesn't satisfy the fence condition, and our attempt at transforming a fenced non-monotone invariant to a fenced monotone invariant is unsuccessful. Overall, we have shown that interpolation-based invariant inference can infer an invariant in a polynomial number of subcodes whenever there's an invariant that satisfies the fence condition, a property of the reachability of the Hamming boundary of the invariant, and has a syntactic form that matches uh, results and algorithms in exact concept learning that we have leveraged using a special transformation from classification to invariant inference. And we also talked about the robustness of the fence condition and the effect program transformations could have on invariant inference. Thank you very much.